This is the Monday, August 28, 2017 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old towns of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. France's leaders were old and tired, and the oldest and most tired was Marshal Pétain. On June 16th, Pétain asked for an armistice. And the master of the master race must go to Paris to tour the streets of what was once the city of light. Gone is the Republic of France. Gone is free speech and a free representative government. Gone is liberty, equality, fraternity. The people weep as their glory departs, for they don't as yet know that France has hope a rallying point. Charles de Gaulle, a soldier in the great tradition of Foch, is not surrendering. He will continue to fight, gathering about him loyal Frenchmen from all over the world to become the Free French Army, the Fighting French. Bonjour, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. This week, our time machine takes us into Nazi-occupied France to meet a bold patriot with a famous Uncle Charles. Her name was Genevieve de Gaulle, and she did the hard work of resistance behind enemy lines that the general urged from exile. General Charles de Gaulle speaks to the people of the United States. I am glad to be on American soil. I take this opportunity to thank the American people for the wonderful effort they have made to win this war today as in 1918 your American boys are fighting side by side with the French soldiers together we are marching on the road to Berlin, to Tokyo, to a final victory. Our guide on this mission is Paige Bowers, and her book is The General's Niece, the little-known de Gaulle who fought to free occupied France. The book taps a rich historical well of interviews with family members, former associates, prominent historians, and never-before-seen papers written by de Gaulle herself. It explores her relationship as confidant and daughter figure to the legendary French patriot. Paige Bowers is a news and features writer whose work you may have seen in Time Magazine, USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, New York Times, People, wherever fine writing is found. She holds a master's degree in modern European history and teaches about French history and culture at Louisiana State University. For more on our guest, visit pagebowers.com, follow at Paige Bowers on Twitter, or toss a like to facebook.com slash pagebowersauthor. Okay, now that we've landed in Nazi-occupied France, let's join Paige Bowers and meet the General's niece. I'm joined on the line from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, by Paige Bowers, author of The General's Niece, the little-known de Gaulle who fought to free occupied France. Thank you so much for making the time to chat with the History Author Show. Thank you so much for having me. 
Well, you were passionate about this book when you first contacted me. Then I caught your passion. I read The General's Niece, and I picked up here on Genevieve de Gaulle's passion for liberty, for France, for her post-war work. She was somebody who really stood on her own and continues to stand on her own in history outside the shadow of this famous family member, this really towering figure in France and in World War II. It seems incredible that nobody has ever shared her story with the English-speaking world before. So how did it fall to you to fill this gap in the record and bring us this really incredible woman's story? That's a great question. If we're looking for a magical, really authory response to us, I don't have that. I was in graduate school in 2010. I went back later in life, and I remember reading General de Gaulle's war memoirs. And I completely skipped over the dedication page. I I just breezed past it. And the dedication page, he dedicates it to his niece, Jean Vieve. And if I had not been reading in desperation, as one does when one is in graduate school, I would have done the journalist thing and say, you know, I wonder why he dedicated his war memoirs to his niece. I wonder what type of woman she was. I wonder, you know, what her story is. Instead, I was trying to work through the whole book. And that's kind of a sad commentary on women's history. But alas, that's me. I'm I'm confessing this. A couple years later, I was teaching a class at LSU. And there was a news story that came out about this same Genevieve, who was going to be interred in the Pantheon, which is this grand mausoleum for great French historical figures. Voltaire's there, for example. He's no slouch. (laughs) And so I stopped and I started reading a little bit more about this, finding out who she was. And, you know, I was right where you are right now. I could not believe that no one had ever told her story for an English-speaking audience. So I jumped on it because I love telling good stories. And this was a wonderful story, in my opinion. So I would have been a fool not to. And something that plays into that, this lack of the story being told, the broader idea that you just spoke about, that there's this void of women in history, is early on in the general's niece, you set the stage here for the experiences Mm -hmm. that women had, not only during the war, during the resistance, during the fighting, but after Mm -hmm. you write that we have plenty of old soldiers sitting around swapping war stories, writing memoirs, but this is not something that women did. This is not something that we encourage women to do, especially men. I'm sure when you meet a woman, and when I used to book guests for TV, you book in some of these women and you say, wow, back then we didn't have them technically what we say now, allowing them on the front lines, but they were certainly over fighting and they were doing things. And they were some of the first women that went through things like Marine training. It's an honor to meet those women. And I think if you're not comfortable, if you're in a very male dominated society, a society like some of these older Greek, French societies where in those days, I mean, think about it in the war, in these years, women don't even have the right to vote in France. So this is very much, hey, that that's men's work. I don't want to hear about it because it makes me feel a little bit small. And so women just sort of kept quiet about it. And the record is simply not as robust, not as complete. So there's your challenge as a historian wanting to fill in this mysterious name you see here in a dedication by General de Gaulle. How do you go about that, fleshing out Genevieve's story? There's a couple of different ways. She wrote two slender memoirs at the end of her life, one about her time in a concentration camp, there's a spoiler, and then another about her work on behalf of the poor in the Paris area and then throughout France. So you start there, you reach out to family members. Her daughter, Isabel, is kind of the keeper of the family flame. So you sit with her, you go to France, which is not a horrible thing to do. (laughs) And you sit with her, you know, you sit with her and you talk to her and find out certain things. You get her help. She made some introductions for me to people who had either been associates of hers during the war and dear friends of hers afterwards, or who had known her, you know, privately, who had worked with her when she worked on behalf of the poor. And you sit down and you talk with him. The 
challenge, of course, was to flesh out this wartime story to make it as rich as possible. I was very fortunate, uh, you referenced the beginning of the book, where I spent a lovely, unbelievable afternoon with two women who were teenage resistors, just like she was, who risked their lives just like she did, and became dear friends with her first in the camp and then after the war. And to sit down with these two 90-year-old women who had seen so much and endured so much, it was an amazing bit of living history. It was a gift, honestly, to sit there with them and find out about their experiences, first as resistance figures, but also as women who, as we've already said, you know, just didn't have the same amount of rights as men did at the time. But they stepped up and they believed in this certain idea of France and they acted on that. So you do that, you go to archives. There's some archival papers that I was able to see. She started this group for women who were resistors and deportees after the war, you know, to help them get back on their feet. And they had a newsletter It was a fascinating look into what life was like for women who were recovering after the war, who were rebuilding. And then, you know, the energies, their energies, what they devoted themselves to. And it told a really interesting story as well. So bit by bit, you take all these different things and you piece them together into the book I foisted upon you, what, about a month or so ago? (laughs) (laughs) No, hardly. No, it's one of those books that... I say sometimes I'm afraid looking back. It scares me that I might not have had this book put in my hands because it's that dramatic. It's that much that it sticks with you. It feels like it's that important. And you think, wow, I might not have met that person. You hear people say sometimes, you know, I went to this party by mistake. I didn't want to go. Or I went to this Mm -hmm. wedding with a friend. And that's how I met my wife. Or that's how I got my great job. Or, you know, my husband happened to be there. And he was also brought by a friend. Well, thank you for coming to my party. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. That's that's what this book is. And there's going to be plenty of wine, we know, because it's uh, it's in France, after all. Right. So (laughs) we're going to be drinking the good stuff, not the Vichy water. Right. Back up there for a second, you talked about speaking with her daughter and about building the general's niece by going and meeting these women. That, for me, is always a fascinating step and something I like to dig into for listeners. When you're going over there and meeting these women, people oftentimes, you have to work them into it. I've had that myself. You want to book a guest and they'll kind of put you through your paces, some more than others. Some are just glad to talk with you, glad to share it. Others are really guarded. They want to make sure you're going to handle, in this case, their family member, their mother, their friend, their comrade, with the right kind of sensitivity. So where did these women fall on that spectrum, and how did you approach them here as an American coming over and wanting to write this book? That's a really good question. I started with Javier's daughter, and I sat down, and you know, she asked, me obviously a lot of questions about myself and how I got interested in this, what my background was, and that sort of thing. I think she saw that I was okay, which is why she opened this door to other contacts. You know, some of those worked out, some of those didn't. But the one with the two resistors that I spoke with, that involved a little bit of begging. You know, I felt like I really needed to sit with them to bring that part of the book to life. I mean, because there were other testimonies, there were other oral histories about that time, but I wanted to sit with flesh and blood who had been there. Originally, what happened was Isabel gave me the number for one of the women. And what she told me, the woman in question, was, I will not sit down with you unless the other woman is present. So I said, well, I, you know, Isabel didn't give me this number. She goes, well, I'm going to give it to you. Call her up. Tell her that Isabel gave you the number. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm trying to get her to trust me. Yeah. So there was a lot of calling and begging and all this kind of stuff. And I thought it was going to fall through. So I called after days of emailing and calling. I eventually called the first resistor back. I said, you know, I haven't heard from Isabel about this other woman. She goes, don't worry about it. I saw her today. We're on. It's good. We'll do it at the end of the week. And it just was like that. And it was 
a little bit of dumb luck, but I'll take that any day to get the stories that I got from them. And beyond the stories that they told about themselves as young women, it was like sitting down with two grandmothers who wanted to talk to you more about, you know, books and current events and philosophy and passion for life and all this kind of stuff. It was a wonderful afternoon. I'll never forget it. I really won't. So yeah, it took some doing, but I'm very grateful that this worked. Well, so am I. I'm glad you persisted here as a reader that we're able to have this story because as you're speaking, it's such a stark reminder, a sweet reminder, not not very stark, but just a reminder that this is a period of four or five years in their lives or what have you, but they're real flesh and blood people. They've done plenty of other things. Here you're wanting to speak about this time, and to them, it's 70 years ago. You're almost living more in the period of the war than they are. They're just, oh, yeah, that's something that we did, and we talked about that a little <laughs> at the top, right? This is something, oh, I yeah. don't really want to talk about that. You, there's also a part of it that's modesty. Often soldiers will say that people that brag the most, you scratch the surface, and they really didn't do anything. It's the the people who are the real heroes are the people that sit there and nod and say, well, I was there. The other people were heroes. Those are the people that, you know, let's zero in on them and find out their real stories. And the thing is, you get them talking. They, They did say no one ever talks about the women, but they've got stories if you sit and you listen. These stories are heroic, they're heartbreaking, they're detailed once you get going, and they're truly remarkable. So it was good to talk to them about wartime, but also this friendship with this exceptional woman whose uncle was the beacon of France's liberation. It was really fascinating. What was their relationship like before the war? How old is she? How old is he before he becomes this figure and they develop this unique cross-channel relationship, long-distance relationship as uncle and niece? So jean was his oldest niece. Charles de Gaulle was the middle of five children. His oldest brother, Xavier, was jean father. This relationship with her uncle doesn't start until about, I guess it was the late 20s. Xavier de Gaulle and his family were living in the Saarland, which was a League of Nations managed territory after World War I. What happened at the end of the war, World War I, the Germans went out and flooded a bunch of prominent French mines is restitution from the Versailles Treaty. What happened was they gave this area, the Saarland, to be managed by the League of Nations. And the French came in, Xavier de Gaulle was called in to manage or get the mines in the Saarland back up and running. So this branch of the de Gaulle's was living in the Saarland. And then when jean de Gaulle was about five, tragedy struck the family. Her mother died on an operating room table. And it was devastating for the family. It was especially devastating for Xavier, who loved his young wife. And he fell into this deep depression. The family came in to help him. And jean had this feeling, you know, even at her young age, that she would do anything to help her father to be there for him, to lift his spirits, whatever it took. She'd follow him around like a little puppy, hoping to make things better for him. One of the things that was around this time, Xavier's brother Charles moves nearby with his family for a military posting that he had. And when that happens, Javier gets to know him and his family a little better. And he becomes this steadying figure to have around. And as she grows older, he becomes this tremendous confidant for her because she discovered over the years, because her father was so sensitive, so fragile, there were a lot of things she was experiencing and feeling You know, she didn't want to trouble him. So she felt she could talk to her uncle in a way that she couldn't talk to her her own father, whose feelings she wanted to spare. So that's how she and her uncle Charles formed this very tight bond. 
And she looked up to him. And he looked to her as kind of this daughter figure. She was like him in some respects. She was very bookish. She loved to write. She was very passionate about history and current affairs. So they would have these long talks, not just about life, but about what was going on in Europe at the time. And that part of it there about her, she's not much older than five. She's just five about in that Christmas. It's Christmas. She loses her, has just lost her mom. You talk about this in the general's niece. Mm -hmm. And when you do, you quote her as saying something that she learned during that. And that is hardships such as these were something that should be endured without complaint. Yes. And in a history book, it's great to see something planted like that. And of course, a good writer of history like yourself puts that in there and you say, oh, that's great foreshadowing and it's great character development. And here's a real person who has it in their life. Here's how you explain her coming as a young woman and being influenced as a very young child. Mm -hmm. Your heart breaks for her. And then you say, wow, if I was five and I lost my mom, I'd probably be a puddle on the floor. Again. Right. I'm so glad that I, that I didn't suffer a tragedy like that, a loss like that. And yet for her, she at that young age decides, well, my father needs me and I'm going to pick up and I'm going to do what needs to be done and I'm going to have the stiff upper lip. And if my uncle can help me, then they grow closer. Yeah. And that's, that's an amazing inspiration for anybody. And I think in the general's niece, you start to see here at five already, she's grown up. So many people now, they're, they're in their 30s, and you say, when are you going to grow up, right? <laughs> Get out of my basement. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, if this is the thing. She's already on that path as, as a young woman, yeah. a very young child, isn't she? Yes, she was very young. She grew up very young. Her siblings viewed her as a little mother figure. You know, she made sure they'd do their homework, and if they didn't, they'd hit each other with Greek and Latin dictionaries. And <laughs> there's some anecdote about her hitting her brother with a brush or a comb when he wasn't behaving himself. She stepped in and she was going to provide some sort of order and structure that came from her dear loving mother, who she lost. And I think over time, what you see, and this actually is a broader kind of commentary on the de Gaulle family and the way children were raised to believe in duty and family and France and history, to debate current events around the dinner table, to recite Homer from memory, to embrace their deep Catholic faith, and to do something if they're called upon to do something. And beyond, I think, this terrible tragedy that hit her family when she was very young, I think, you know, part of the way she responded to hardship and to later the war this is just what you did. You know, not everybody would see this the way she did, but this was, she was raised this way. And there was never any question that she would step up. There was never any question that she would do something, as they called it in the beginning days of the war, before they said, we're going to resist. There was never any question. This is just what you did. And then later, when she could have easily said, I've been through horrible things in the war. My health is frail. But she wasn't wired that way. She wasn't wired to say, it's time for me to rest and not do anything. She looked around her and saw that women like her were struggling and needed help. So she helped them. And then after that, you know, she raised a family and she could have easily said, I've got all these different things going on, these different pursuits. I'm raising these young children. Yes, this is sad that the poor are struggling in France. You know, some people would say, I just can't. She found a way to do it. She was really an exceptional person with this tremendous sense of duty who made a mark on her country, you know, kind of at the same time that her uncle did. But you hear less about her than you do him. So it was fascinating to read about her and write about her. And to read about her. Yeah. So this is really being passed on here. It's something that you're picking up throughout the book. You're seeing this young woman, whether it's that girl who's just barely five years old at a Christmas without her mother who's just passed away, or she's in college, isn't she, when the Germans invade and France falls. She's not that old then either. She's 19, yeah, as so. a matter of fact. <laughs> what were you doing at 19? Yeah, 15? right. <laughs> what were you doing? I mean, I, I, I thought back. 
about what I was doing at 19. And I think I was interested in current events too. And I was interested in politics and things like that. But you and I have not been in a situation, we've not found ourselves in a situation like she did that summer in 1940, where your country's overrun by the enemy. Your leader at the time is saying, we need to quit fighting. And you understand that the world that you grew up in is is about to change. And it's not certain the ways in which it'll change, but you know, it's going to change in a way that you won't like. And she knew that was about to happen. And she decided, I'm going to do something. Her journey toward that was not, you know, instant overnight. But I think early in the resistance, this decision was not you know, the resistance didn't explode and become something on June 18th, 1940. It was a slow building snowball that grew little by little. And she was a part of that from day one. And you need somebody to push that snowball and get it going. It's not just setting it off at the top. That's something she does. And you made me think back to 19 and being asked, I will answer. The first thing that popped into my head, the little guy in my head that (laughs) I don't always listen to because sometimes his jokes are just terrible and make me groan or what have you or his (laughs) answers. But on this one at 19, I said, I remember having my arm in a cow because I was in the animal science program at Rutgers and I worked at the farm and that was one of the things you would do because your cows out there, folks where your meat and your milk comes from, they are, you know, they don't uh, make little cows the old fashioned way, shall we say. So that's part of what you have to do to make sure that the to you get your milk and all that kind of thing. So anyway, that was what popped into my head. And even that for me was, I remember I was looking at my notes at first when the professor was demonstrating how to do this. And I just looked up from my notes and he hadn't broken his cadence at all. He was just speaking regularly. And then all of a sudden there he is with his arm having been completely eaten by a cow. And then of course he takes it out and says, whoa, my watch. And a little bit of veterinary humor. But uh, oh, goodness. <laughs> so that's what it made me think of. And then you think of when you are that age, the world is very jokey. Nothing is that serious. And here is this woman, Genevieve de Gaulle, and she's fighting against that kind of apathy. There's this phrase that you bring up in the general's niece, what could be done? This was just kind of that yeah. Gallic shrug that's expressed here in reaction to Marshal Patton. I mean, this is a big figure, a big hero, a towering figure, and he's telling you he's giving up. He was a towering war hero from World War One. Yeah. He was the victor of Verdun. He pushed the Germans back in this, you know, one of the bloodiest battles of World War One, and the tide turned in the war. He he was actually General de Gaulle's mentor at one point during that time. And then they had a falling out right before World War II. There were different reactions to this call to put down your arms on June 17th, 1940. Some people were resigned to do it, but devastated because, you know, we're France, we fight. This is unacceptable. But there were others that said, you know, if Marshal Pétain, war hero, is telling us to do this, he saved us once, he'll save us again. How that could it be? There were some people who did not appreciate this about Pétain, and then there were some people that were like, I can accept Pétain, but I hate the Germans. You know, more than anything, people could not accept the Germans, but there were different responses to other realities that were going on. Jean Vieve de Gaulle could not believe that Pétain was saying, lay down your arms. She said, I'm not going to accept this. And then slowly she started responding. You know, she said, I'm going to do something. It was hard to figure out what to do at first because you didn't know where your neighbors stood. You know, you didn't know if they were going to accept the Germans. You didn't know if they accepted Pétain. You didn't know if they hated the whole lot of it. So you had to kind of quietly find your way to figure out where people stood. And then What she would do, she said there were silly little things that she did at first. German soldiers would pass her on the street. She would turn her back on them instead of salute them. Eventually, it built so that she was tearing down a swastika flag that was hanging over a river on a bridge. She would start passing around leaflets that would replicate what her uncle had said on the BBC radio. Because not, not everybody had radios at the time. They were not allowed to have radios. So they, people who had concealed radios would type this out, print it. People would pass it around to their neighbors. 
And then in the age long before Twitter, this started going viral. So that's how this spread. You know, they draw the cross of Lorraine on buildings with chalk. And then they start saying, okay, this is fine and good, she and her student friends, but we need to start doing something bigger. Some of her cohorts in Brittany went to join her uncle in London to fight at his side or to help him. And she said, I'm going to stay back here in France. And she went down to Paris, enrolled in the Sorbonne, and lived with her aunt. And her aunt, I believe it was five children. So her aunt was living alone in this house with five children because her uncle, her aunt's husband, was working in Lyon for a bank. So imagine this woman with five children under the age of 12 plus a teenaged girl. This is a busy house, and they're starting to run papers around for a resistance network there. They're stuffing paperbacks full of pictures of General de Gaulle that they sneak out little by little and send to people who just want to know what he looks like. And so this was an incredibly busy house. And eventually, because the name de Gaulle was, you know, people who had the name de Gaulle were viewed with suspicion. Eventually, they did get a knock on the door. So they did all this a tremendous risk to their lives and to their loved ones' lives, but they believed in something. And it's truly tremendous what they did. And you were talking about she offers what she calls these symbolic, almost ridiculous acts of resistance. But Tan, if you needed a reason to give it up, that would have been it. It's not as if everybody picks a flag out of the pile there that first day. Mm -hmm. People are confused. They don't know what they're supposed to do. And you spoke about the de Gaulle's tradition of hashing issues out, a broader French tradition of speaking in the public square. Mm -hmm. Here under the occupation, she maybe for the first time in her life since she was that little five-year-old girl who took this independence streak has to watch what she says because she's in a France now where she doesn't know where people stand. And she eventually has to find her way into this group and decide how she's going to take some larger role in resisting what goes on, especially as she's almost wearing this de Gaulle mask. So how does she go about navigating these troubled waters as this curtain of suppression descends on France and she doesn't quite know who she can trust yet? By the time she wound up in... Paris, the people who ran with her aunt and who came to her aunt's house for dinner, people pretty much knew where they stood. And, you know, they would talk about, I think there was one of the things that, that I write about is the, the roundup of Jewish citizens for the Velodrome d'Hiver. You know, there was a dinner party she had one night. One of the women who showed up late was an ambulance driver who had just been there and had seen the horrible conditions and so on and so forth. And there was a pretty open conversation about what was happening. And there was one woman who said she the woman considered herself a good Catholic. And she said, well, what do you expect? They are Jews. And she held her tongue at that time, John the did, but she thought this is every bit as much of a crime to sit there and accept the way things are. You know, what's next? So these conversations were being had. I think she might have held her tongue at that time, too, because she was polite in her aunt's house with her aunt's company more than anything. But yeah, the closer it got to the end of the war, and while she was still working as um, a resistor, you did have to be careful. You had to be careful because your life was at stake and you didn't know who was in cahoots with the Germans. You didn't know if you were going to be betrayed by someone. You didn't know. We're enjoying a conversation with Paige Bowers, author of The General's Niece, the little known de Gaulle who fought to free occupied France. For more on our guest, visit pagebowers.com. Follow at Paige Bowers on Twitter or toss a like to Facebook.com slash Paige Bowers author. Booklist writes of the general's niece, quote, Bowers chronicles the remarkable life and times of Genevieve de Gaulle, Charles de Gaulle's niece and an active participant in the French resistance 
during World War II. Rising rapidly through the ranks of resistance, she was eventually captured by the Nazis and sent to the notorious Ravensbrück concentration camp. After surviving the unspeakable, she devoted the remainder of her life to fighting for social justice as well as for the rights of fellow former prisoners of war. Paige, how do the Nazis ultimately catch up with Genevieve de Gaulle, and what are the conditions in this concentration camp where she's a VIP prisoner, not in the sense that she's getting any luxurious treatment, but in the sense that she has an uncle who's leading the free French from London. She's an important person, what we'd call today a high-value target. So what is her experience at Ravensbrook? Uh, well, let's let's start from with your first question. How do they catch up with Javier? What happened was the Gestapo paid a student at the Sorbonne to infiltrate the resistance network she was a part of. It was called Défense de la France. And what they wanted him to do was to provide them with a list of names who were in the group, of people who were in the group, so that they could make some arrests and shut them down. They paid the student very handsomely to betray his cohorts, and that's exactly what he did. So he had his list, he gave it to the Gestapo, and the Gestapo actually was working in cahoots with a, a group of French police officers and petty criminals who would help them with roundups and who would do their bidding, who would do interrogations and torture people and this sort of thing. And, and the head of this gang was probably one of the most promising or well-regarded uh, inspectors in the Sûreté Générale. His name was Pierre Bonny. Pierre Bonny was waiting for Javier de Gaulle in this bookstore uh, where she was going to drop some letters and such one day. He was waiting there with some of his men. He realized that he had a resistor coming in there that he was about to nab. He did not know it was General de Gaulle's niece, but he got her. And then he hauled her in. So she was betrayed by one of her own and they started going through the bag that she had on her, and they found a false ID she had, saying her name was Jean-Vierre Garnier. And they said, "Is this? Are these papers real?" And she de- she decided that if she ever was arrested, she would tell people who she really was, you know, because it was a source of pride. You you hauled in a De Gaulle. I'm going to tell you, I'm a De Gaulle fighting for this. So. Bonnie asks her, are these papers real? And she said, actually, no. And then he says, then what's your name? And she says, Jean-Pierre de Gaulle. And he realized right then that if, you know, the tide turned for France and the war and that it was discovered that he had hauled in the general's niece, he was not going to come out of this okay. Still, he handed her over to the Gestapo. The Gestapo first held her in a prison for a while before deporting her to Germany, to the only all-women's concentration camp there named Ravensbrück. It's about 50 miles north of Berlin. Because by then, the number of women in this camp was, it was over capacity. It was just unruly. It was out of control there. By the time she gets there and they process her and give her her number and her clothes that she's going to wear there, they're still not really aware that she's the general's niece. It takes some time. So she's beaten and hit just like everyone else. She's starving just like everyone else. She's not able to use soap. She's, you know, sleeping a couple to a short, you know, a very thin bunk conditions are horrible. And then one of the women says, you know, once they figure out who she is, the prisoners figured it out first. And she actually gave a little speech about who her uncle was and what he stood for in the washroom of the camp. The prisoners first tried to protect her because she started getting sick and frail and she could not keep up with the work that was demanded of her. So she'd get hit, beaten a lot. So they'd try to hide her. And then eventually it became clear to the camp administration that they had General de Gaulle's niece. 
and they better change her situation. So they did improve her living quarters, though it was not palatial what she had. It was just cleaner. She had cleaner clothes, but it was not much better. It was just a slight improvement and gave her medicine to help her get back to health. So that's how it evolved over time. There's a group of women at Ravensbrück concentration camp that listeners familiar with the Nazi atrocities and medical experiments may be a little bit familiar with. They're known as the Rabbits. Who were they? Uh, the Rabbits were a group of Polish women who were fairly healthy. Uh, they were singled out so that the Germans at the camp could conduct pretty horrible experiments on them. They were looking for some sort of medicine to fight infection. They were looking for the best ways to do this. So they would injure these women's legs. They would shoot infection into them. Just, it just mangled these women in the interest of some sick science that they were trying to practice. And by doing all these cruel experiments on them, they ruined these women's lives and their health. Um, some of them died, but the ones that did survive, they came out of this and they called them the rabbits because their legs were so mangled, they hopped around. And everybody in the camp knew about them. They tried to protect them where they could. And after the war, the women who did survive at Ravensbrück would mount a campaign to make sure that the German government paid them restitution for what they had done. Because some of the women couldn't work. Their lives were ruined. Javier de Gaulle and her cohorts fought a very long battle to get Germany to acknowledge what they had done and pay up. There is a moment in the general's niece related to the rabbits. As Hitler's Reich collapses, the German soldiers at Ravensbrück attempt to destroy evidence of their atrocities. Mm -hmm. Dead men tell no tales. This is the same case here for women and some of these rabbits in the general's niece offer to make an amazing sacrifice. They offer to switch numbers and die in the places of the rabbits to take the place of these women because it's so important that their story gets out that what has been done to them is is exposed to the world. They're hiding them. They're hiding them underneath their barracks. They're trying to keep them as living testament so that nobody can deny it. Mm. The same idea as Eisenhower marching those German citizens through the concentration camps, making sure it was all recorded. I always think that's such an incredible example of being foresighted that he thought someday people are going to say that this didn't happen. Yeah. You would thought at the moment, gosh, we, the ashes are still in the air. The bodies are still here. We could still smell it. We have thousands of people that are reduced to skeletons. How could anybody ever deny that this happened? But with an eye to history, he understood someday that will happen. So talk a little bit about the ways prisoners tried to get word out of Ravensbrook about what they'd suffered. Well, there was one way that they did it in particular that was striking. They found a way of writing kind of cryptic letters in pen, but then sort of adding the details about what was really going on there by using their own urine as ink. And they would write in between the lines to say, this is what happened today. These are the people that have been experimented on. These are the women that died, you know, this sort of thing. And so what they would do is they would send it their vague letter to a family member, but there was like a little code in there where they knew, the family member knew, if I run an iron over this letter, the urine letters will show up. Wow. And so that's the sneaky way that they got the word out. There are stories like that that inspire you to realize what human beings are capable of. And as people who love history, as everyone listening must be, you realize that they had that eye too towards documenting this so that they wouldn't have died in complete silence and as a warning to people in what became the words never again so that people would always know and that's part of your job here in the general's niece where you're writing down what these women have to say and recording it so that we don't forget it they're a great living resource mm -hmm. when i interviewed andrew nagorski for his book the nazi hunters he said he spoke to a man who'd suffered in a polish camp and it was all so very emotional. Mm -hmm. And he said to him afterwards, I'm sorry to bring all that up in the interview because I'm sure you've 
told it a thousand times and it's probably emotional every time. And the man said, Oh no, I have never told this story before to anybody. That's amazing. And he said, what your family? No, he said, nobody ever asked. So I just never told anybody what happened. Wow. The, The shocking flip side of not wanting women to tell their stories is sometimes we just wanted to move on. You didn't want to know. You knew you suffered so much that we don't ask. And that if somebody like an author or somebody who's interested doesn't go and record that, it's lost forever. That human mm-hmm. capital, that knowledge of what they suffered is just gone forever. One of the interviews that I did with the resistors, I mean, you get into some, there's a heartbreaking story. I mean, there's so many heartbreaking stories from a concentration camp, but there was one There's this group of women that met each other at the camp. They called them the Resistance Sisters. They forged this lifelong bond there during this horrible time. And they were doing roundups. They were sending people to be gassed. One of the women was trying to protect her friend's mother, who would have been singled out for her white hair being useless because she was old and couldn't do as much work as some of the younger prisoners. So she was trying to protect her. She put a scarf over her head. She pinched her cheeks so they looked a little young and rosy. She walked her around, tried to hold her up, do all this kind of thing. And then, uh, you know, at one point they're saying, they're going to come for us. They're going to come for you. We're going to hide you. Let's hide you up in the rafters of the barracks. And this elderly woman, realizing that her time had come, said, my dear, I'm not an acrobat. I always said that when I my time came, I would accept it. And they did what they could to protect her, but it wasn't enough. And the woman I spoke with lives with this. It haunts her to this day. She's 95 now. And this haunts her still. You know, she cries still when she thinks about it and talks about it. What they went through there, what they did for each other, when it would have been very easy to be selfish and keep an extra morsel of bread for yourself or not share the bread on a day when you had worked so hard and were starving. You know, these little gestures that they shared with people, sometimes that was the only thing that they had to keep them going. And the friendships that came out of that, that's, you know, as hard and devastating as some of what they endured was, how horrible the war was, how it impacted France. One of the things that really impressed me or stayed with me about this story are the friendships that emerged from just unspeakable circumstances. If they survived it, these women were bonded together for the rest of their lives, and they would do anything for each other. They didn't always agree, like sisters, but there was an unbreakable bond there, and that's what emerged from this. And the strength of those friendships is just a really beautiful part of this story. When you talk about those inhumane conditions they endured in part by being humane, doing these small acts of humanity, like giving away the food you so desperately need to the very sick or to the rabbits, the other victims of these atrocities. At one point in the general's niece, Heinrich Himmler offers a prisoner exchange to each of the de Gaulle's. Mm -hmm. Says uh, Genevieve, you know, we'll let you out if you give us back this high profile German. And this is another one of those moments where you say, those are people that are cut above. It inspires you to be a better person. You ask yourself, how how would I respond to that if one of my nieces was in there and I said, oh gosh, you want her to get out and you have a chance. Or if you're in that camp and you say, I have a chance to escape these brutal conditions. So How do the two de Gaulle's react to that? And how do their responses to this offer from Himmler himself match up? They turned him down. They turned him down. You know, they could have saved her and that sort of thing. But they also thought about, you know, there were other people who were in camps that they knew about. They didn't want to show one of their own favoritism and they didn't want to be criticized for that. They didn't want to do that. So she stayed for a time, and eventually her release was negotiated without an exchange. They did not accept that from him, from Himmler. And they both independently came to that same rejection. Yeah. They were offended by the notion of it comes across. The yeah, niece. right. Forget it. We're staying until everybody's out. Yeah. It's a little bit like John McCain in yeah. – 
the Vietnam War where they want to release him because his father's an admiral and they figure they'll get him out. And he says... They didn't want favoritism. Yeah, that, it's incredible because whether it's the idea of, well, what can be done? Patan's not fighting. Why should I? Or anything. There's so many little temptations to take that easy route. And every step here, they choose the tough route. You have a fellow prisoner that you quote in the general's niece saying of Genevieve de Gaulle, she had a real seriousness of purpose, but she was always happy, laughing, and prone to joke around. This is something, again, that you think is incredible. You look at the suffering that they're enduring. War movies and books, they tend to end with Germany's surrender. They tend to not show that side of it unless it's a farce like Hogan's Heroes. But mm. your book and Genevieve de Gaulle's story continues after that. You spoke a little bit in the beginning about her post-war activities and how she carries mm -hmm. this spirit into the privations after the war. The mm -hmm. times don't end with VE Day. How does she live after in those decades and what does she contribute? At the end of the day, so much of this story is about the choices we make when the world around us is a mess. You could take the easy way out or you can do the right thing, which is often hard but worth it. And at the end of the war, after her release from Ravensbrück, she knew that women who had been in the camp and survived it, they were going to go back to France in terrible physical shape with just horrible health issues. And they were going to go back, and chances are there were some of them that would go back to no husbands, maybe no families. A lot of them didn't have jobs, or some of them didn't have homes. So she knew that there was a terrible situation that was going to happen after the war, and something needed to be done about that. So there she is in terrible physical health herself, and she begins to give these paid speeches in Switzerland where her father was the consul general in Geneva. She gives these big talks to people about what she had just seen and endured and what the reality was going to be for women who were coming back to France. And she started raising money that way. And she got free medical care for a lot of the women who had been through what she had just been through. She banded together with a couple of other female deportees to create an organization that was specifically designed to help women after the war by getting them housing, by getting them free medical care, by giving them just honestly a place to sit down with people who had experienced what they had and just talk to each other and give each other moral support over tea. And this organization lasted till a little bit after her death in 2002, but it was a really remarkable group of women that had this shared bond and helped each other after the war. So was one of the things that she did. And then after that, France went through this period they called the Trente Glorias, the 30 Glorious Years, where after the war, they went through this great economic expansion that opened up a lot of things, presumably. It didn't extend to everyone. And eventually, I guess it was about 1958, she meets a priest who had been working in the slums of Paris. She had no idea that there were slums around the gates of Paris. And this preacher took her into these slums and she looked around her and the people she saw reminded her you know, with their faces so devastated and dehumanized, these poor living in ramshackle huts with hungry children, it reminded her of what she had seen in Robinsbrook. So she devoted the rest of her life to helping this preacher help the poor. And so what you see here is that this very formative experience of wartime really informed everything she did for the rest of her life. It influenced the woman she became. It influenced her passions for service, like where she devoted her energies. And it also gave her such an appreciation for the life and the friendship she had, the relationship she had. She knew life was short, but God, look at her life. It was so rich. She made every moment count. And I think, you know, you can be inspired by that. Definitely an inspiration. And that brings me to my final question, which is bittersweet for me. Mm. It's a kind of book I could talk about all day. 
What do you hope readers, especially your female readers, will take away from the general's niece to not just get that inspiration, but to further the cause of liberty that is this remarkable woman's ideal throughout her life? Anyone can make a difference. And you don't have to be a de Gaulle. You don't have to be male. Um, you just have to want to do it. You you can look around anywhere in your world and you don't have to sit silently by and accept things. If you don't like what's being handed to you, you can do something about it and you can make a difference. And that's really what this story is about, making the hard choices to make this world we live in the place we know it can be, just this better place. Well, Paige Bauer is author of The General's Niece. Thank you for joining me today and for sharing in English and for everybody who reads English to be able to enjoy the story of this remarkable figure of the French resistance. It's a story for everybody who loves liberty and loves freedom and wants to defend and protect it against all threats, the threats of a new dark age in her day or the threats that we face today. I think if you're anybody who swells a little bit with pride for our French allies, we are two nations linked in such long bonds of friendship going all the way back to Lafayette and Washington. Here's a modern figure in France, well, modern relative to Washington and Lafayette, who we can embrace, who we can learn about, and especially for women who don't have a lot in the historical record of this sort of figure. Really is a great book. I enjoyed it so much. I'm really glad that you sent it to me. Thank you. And I wish you all the luck in the world with it. Dean, thank you so much. I enjoyed being on your show. Once more, the red, white, and blue of France is raised on high. Once more, their leaders, General de Gaulle and the famous General Giraud, stand united in the common cause with the leaders of their allies. For out of the ashes of the defeat and the humiliation of France, her soul has been born again. Again, the book is The General's Niece the little-known de Gaulle who fought to free occupied France. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there, or even navigate using the Amazon banner on our homepage the next time you purchase anything from Amazon. You go to historyauthor.com, we take it Amazon, and amazon.com gives us a small portion of every dollar you spend at no additional charge in your shopping cart. For just a few extra taps of your finger, you can help us keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. And that means we can keep bringing you great books like The General's Niece. My sincere thanks to Paige Bowers for joining us and for introducing us to the sort of historical figure we love around here. One who had a famous name, but didn't coast on it or let it weigh her down. Instead, Genevieve de Gaulle built upon the legacy of her birth, carving a place in history of her very own. For more on our guest, visit pagebowers.com, follow at pagebowers on Twitter, or toss a like to facebook.com slash pagebowersauthor. And while you're at it, let us know what you think of the book and the interview, on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash History Author. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for next Monday's all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today. And have a great week. The boys won the war and came home from the fight. The last night on Broadway was almost his night. But ever since then, it's a different street. Gone are the places where the gang used to be. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.